the country of Afghanistan has been through so much upheaval in the last few years. But author John Weaver reminds us that upheaval creates opportunities for the gospel. Many of our brothers and sisters there have said, wow, we're surprised. Though we feel this extra pressure and danger like sheep among wolves, we are able to communicate and share with others because it has created such a sense of dissatisfaction with Islam. We talk about that and this sense of desperation. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We are in the studio this week with John Weaver. We have had him here before. He is the author of several books, uh, Inside Afghanistan, A Flame on the Front Line, and a third book, Najiba, A Love Story from Afghanistan. He lived in Afghanistan for a number of years, served the people there. If you haven't heard him before here, you are in for a treat this week. John Weaver, welcome back to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you, Todd. It's a joy to be with you again, brother. One of the things that we talked about after the Taliban retook Afghanistan, you said, listen, the Taliban are fighters. They're not governors. They're not managers. Um, ha- we're now 20 months into their being the government, even though they're not governors. How's it going? What What is it like on the ground? What is it like economically, uh, keeping the electricity on, all of those things that that we hope a good government will do, how are the Taliban doing at that? Well, in some ways, Todd, they're doing the best that they can, but we would say they're quite Ill, ill-equipped to do so. And because of so much conflict in that region, for decades, Afghanistan has had the assistance of surrounding countries and even NATO and countries like the United States, and that's less now. So therefore, it creates economic problems, it creates border problems, it creates the, you know, just the supply and demand of things getting in and out of the country. So in many ways, it is very challenging. It, I, I don't know if I should say it's the most challenging it's ever been in the whole history of the country, but it is very challenging just for the normal Afghan. And in our context, especially those who are following Jesus, it's very, very challenging for them. So let's let's kind of put a picture to that. Our our friend Ahmed, who mm-hmm. who lives in Kabul, how has his life changed in the last? And maybe he's not a Christian. He's he's mm-hmm. a Muslim. How has his life changed from say five years ago? Mm-hmm. Well, he may have lost his job for various reasons because there's always a transition when a new government comes in and they're sympathetic to their people that are like them. So it's possible, regardless of his ethnicity or his religious affiliation, he may have lost his job, uh, and therefore he's lost his livelihood. And he may have had to move. Maybe he lived in an area where he was renting or maybe even owned a house, and now the powers that be have taken control in a way that he's actually had to move. And that could be various ethnicities or various religious affiliations. So just that disruption Then along with the Taliban, I mean, they're mostly Pashtuns, they're Afghans, it's their homeland, but they're far more strict in their interpretation of what Islamic life looks like. So there could be far more community pressure on Ahmad, regardless, again, of what his ethnicity is or his religious affiliation is, if he's not conforming to everything the Taliban thinks he needs to conform to, to be a good Muslim the way they see it. What are the other major ethnicities and Is that a a fault line where there is battle, or does everyone kind of try to get along? Primarily, we speak of the Pashtun tribe as the majority tribe. And and we talked last time, the Pashtun people, one of the largest unreached people groups in the world. Maybe the largest. That's right. It's Because we're talking about over 50 million, 50 million Muslim Pashtuns that live either in Afghanistan or Pakistan. But within their larger Pashtun affiliation, there could be up to 70 different clans. Most of the Taliban would come from a Pashtun Most background. Most of them would come from a Pashtun okay. background. Now, not all Pashtuns are really you know, embracing that, but in a general sense, most of the Taliban would have been, would, would be Pashtuns. Next is the Tajiks. Now, we say Tajik, we don't mean Tajikistan, but we mean ethnically Farsi or Persian. So then you have affiliation to Iran, 
and Taj- Tajikistan because of the united language that they would have. Then you have the ancient Hazara people, which are more ethnically Mongols or Asians, yeah, and they have more Asian features. And the, the Taliban would trace them all the way back to Buddhism, way, way, you know, way, way back. And that's where there were even statues of Buddha in part of the uh-huh. Hazarajat mountain regions that the Taliban destroyed. Then you have Uzbeks, because Uzbekistan's not so far away. You have Turkmen, that's not so far away because those borders were all split. And then within that, you have little smaller ethnic groups based on those main ones, like Kuchis and Aymak and Shigni and Munji. And among them, you have Sunnis and some very strict, committed, right. conservative Sunnis, and that would be the Taliban. And you also have Shias. And, so, and then you also have Ismailis, which is a kind of an offshoot of that. Uh, and so would the, would the Taliban consider a Shia to be an infidel? I mean, essentially— Well, not 100%. Okay. In a general sense, no, okay. because at least they're Muslims. At okay. least they have the confession of what they would say the Islamic faith. But they're less of in one sense— And then because of the ethnic divide and the ethnic racial tension, that creates even more of an issue. So we want to say, as far as we know, and may it never happen, the Taliban are not really doing ethnic cleansing in their country necessarily. But if I were a Hazara from a Shia background and I wasn't conforming to everything the Taliban wanted me to conform to, then even as a Muslim, I could be mistreated face opposition, lose my job, almost be persecuted as we even talk about that uh-huh. as followers of Christ. Those different ethnicities, do they typically live in different parts of the country where they're mostly separated? Mm-hmm. Or is it all intermingled and your neighbor might be Hazara or he might be Pashtun? Or Well, it's kind of like we would say in the United States. There are geographical areas where we would say, oh, certain people from certain Anglo-Saxon backgrounds live in those areas, but then you go to a big city and you find everything, right? So Afghanistan would be a similar way. There are regions when you look at the map where in general, they would say this is more of a Pashtun area, or this is more of a Hazara area, or this is more of an Uzbek area, and it is unique to geography. So closer to Pakistan, you find more villages that are more Pashtun. Closer to Iran, you find more that are more Tajik, or closer to Uzbekistan, you find the Hazaras traditionally have lived in more of the central western part of the country. But when you're in Kabul, it's like what you were describing. You don't know. My neighbor could be Pashtun, could be Uzbek. Because of the pressure, the new government, and things have just shifted and, and changed, you do find more people coming to the bigger city in hopes of finding a job or finding security or you know that, that, yeah. t- that type of dynamic. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with John Weaver. He is the author of a book called Inside Afghanistan. I would strongly encourage you to get a copy. We'll give you a link at our website, vomradio.net. He lived in Afghanistan for a number of years, served the people there. John, obviously, this is Voice of the Martyrs Radio. We want to talk about Christian persecution. So within the context of those different ethnicities— is there more persecution to, say, a Pashtun Christian than a Hazara Christian, or is it fairly standard within Afghanistan? If, if you come to faith in Christ, there's, there's going to be problems. Mm-hmm. It's pretty standard. That, okay. Yes, if you, if you leave Islam and become a follower of Jesus, a Jesus follower, as they might say, because they still believe in God. They're still going to say, you know, man ba chudoi mondor, man parui soi messias, and I still believe in God, and I'm a follower of Jesus. But of any Afghan, of any ethnicity— were to embrace that and live that and follow that, there is the likelihood of persecution. It is escalated based on the people group. So in this case, the Pashtuns are large and in charge, as we would say, they're in power. So therefore, there are going to be more persecution from them towards the minority groups because already religiously, they're the majority group. And then if they see people who are you know, following the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, then that's going to be problematic. We know that Jesus is redeeming people from every tribe. So even among the Pashtuns, he's doing that. However, most of the fruit has been among the other tribes, among the other ethnic groups. So, So some of the openness of the gospel has been that way. But we believe sovereignly in God's mysterious way of working things. This is the time for the Pashtuns. And there is a elevated witness among them 
harder in the country to do, but from the outside coming in, and there are some of the first fruits among the Pashtun tribe, and we know that one day we get to heaven, and we're all saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain from every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue. But persecution now has also escalated. You can have it from the government, because now you have a strict regime in charge. You can have it from your local mosque or your local religious, you know, they may be from any ethnicity, you know what I'm saying? But they're also being encouraged to, to be a little bit stronger in their, but it also can come from your own family, from your community. So meaning every aspect of how we would talk about the possibility of persecution, it now exists in Af- Afghanistan and it's escalated. Yeah. I believe the last time we talked, they were working on a Pashtun Bible. I- am I remembering that correctly? And it was getting close. Where, where are we with Pashtun scripture translation? There are translation works that are happening among various languages that are spoken in Afghanistan, and Pashtu is one of them. Okay. And it's interesting to see just how life-giving the Word of God is when it's in someone's language. So, I mean, part of it we can't say everything, but now the listeners could imagine that this is being done someplace in the world, and now it's getting into the country because of digital media, social media, because of all the technology. And yes, there's a lot of bad stuff on technology, but God's also using it to to further his kingdom. And a lot of the responses from this social media initiative in local languages, even Pashtu, people are responding, asking more questions, still opposition, people who are against it, but that's, you know, Jesus said that that's kind of how, how things would be. And so thankfully that ministry is ongoing, facing, you know, challenges and difficulties because we know there's spiritual warfare. There's the enemy that doesn't want this to happen, but it is happening. And, and organizations like VOM were a part of that and helping that and praying with that and supporting that and trying to see that come to completion. John, there was a lot of promises made in the negotiation process with the Taliban you know, this is Taliban 2.0, uh, the, the kinder, gentler Taliban. We're going to let girls go to school. Uh, we're going to have more religious freedom. It's going to be different this time. A lot of those promises have already been broken. I think, it's, I mean, the coverage of the girls not being allowed to go to school was very widely covered. Mm-hmm. My question is, did the people in Afghanistan believe that? Like, did they think, oh, okay, it's the Taliban, but it's it's the kinder, gentler Taliban. It's not the old Taliban. Or did they know all along there's no way they're going to keep those promises? I would say it was a political rhetoric. And so (laughs) in one – but I do want to say, you know, Todd, that because Afghanistan's a big country, size of Texas, if you could do a visual, and because of different ethnic tribes, there are places where those rules have not been enforced completely. Mm. Uh, But yes, in a general sense, we've already sadly seen the Taliban break the rules – partly because of their conservative, you know, strict view of of Islam. And I think the average Afghan was wanting to be hopeful. You know what I'm saying? Wanting to be hopeful. I hope they keep their... Just like us when we vote, I hope he keeps his promises. That's exactly exactly (laughs) right. It's exactly right. And yet, sadly, they have not kept a lot of those promises. And it's likely it it comes from pressure within them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So maybe the man who said that had some good intentions. He may have even hoped himself right. they could do some of these things, right? Because this it is 2023, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so is one of the things, and I think it's such an iconic image of the Taliban and, and Afghanistan, is the burqa. Yes. Is the burqa back for women in Afghanistan? If you go outside, you need to be completely covered? That's the expectation. Yes, wow. that's the expectation. And that— people would say that's countrywide. Now, there could be some exceptions of that because, again, you may have a remote village way out in the middle of nowhere. And that also goes back to the Taliban doing their best. I mean, they they tried to install, you know, their version of a governor or a mayor or whatever you want to call the religious, you know, authorities. And even mosque leaders, there have been changes to get people in the mosque that are, because that's the center of society there. Right. But you might find a remote village where there aren't a lot of Pashtuns living there, and you might find ladies still wearing just the traditional head cover like they would have worn a long time ago. Even in that context, they feel this pressure to conform. And so in a general sense, yes, that's, that's the expectation, to wear the burqa, yes. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with John Weaver. He is a longtime resident in Afghanistan, author of a book, Inside Afghanistan, 
So in this context of more government pressure from the Taliban, cultural pressure, societal pressure, tribal pressure, how does a Christian talk to somebody about Jesus with all these different factors kind of working against them or, or trying to stop them from spreading the gospel? Well, part of what's happening in Afghanistan has created a vacuum, spiritually speaking. Like we would say there's an emptiness in all of our souls until God fills it. And then because of the desperation of the situation economically and just the oppression, many Afghan believers are finding other Afghans who are broken, who are desperate, who are open. And then they gently talk about the story that's changed their life, where they're going to introduce what we call God talk, but they're already Muslims, so they already talk about right. God anyway. But they're going to talk <laughs> about God in a different way. They're going to talk about a God who loves me, a God who sees me, a God who steps into my pain and my brokenness and rescues me. And if they find that man or woman or family to be persons of peace, that we would say, then they're going to gently, slowly lead them, what we say from creation, like from God up to Christ and how the Messiah came to give us, to give us new life. But it's very organic it's very much like what we're doing right now in a small group, you know, in a car or in a small house or out at the park or walking. It's organically. But many of our brothers and sisters there have said, wow, we're surprised. Though we feel this extra pressure and danger like sheep among wolves, we are able to communicate and share with others because it has created such a sense of dissatisfaction mm -hmm. with Islam. We talk about that and this sense of desperation. I would think they are watching the person's face. They're listening to the tone of their voice the whole time, just like, is this going south? Because if this goes south, I, I could be arrested. I could be killed. Yes. I'm picturing those cars like you're literally hanging on every word because it's like, okay, which way is this going? Do I need to shut up? Do I need to ask another question? How do they navigate that? Yeah. Well, we would say, you know, Jesus said the Spirit's going to come upon you and give you power to be my witnesses. Amen. So part of it is being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit just prompts things or guides things or gives a yes or gives a no. But part of it is reading the person, mm -hmm. you know, knowing your audience and reading your person. And so we often say, if they say something like, oh, tell me more, well, then you, you might think that's an indication to keep going. So in a general sense, what we believe biblically, a person of peace, they welcome you, but that's just hospitality. Afghans love right. hospitality. They Most love of the hospitality. world can you know, come have a Coke with me. Let's go to yep. Starbucks or let's drink some tea. That's just welcoming the person into your space. But then when you talk about the God story or the God talk or how God's changed your life, when you introduce that, if they seem to, like you're doing now, you're engaging yes. with me and actively listening <laughs> I'm and nodding participating. nodding my head and right? saying, yes, tell me more. So if they're saying that, then you keep going. And then what we would say in a mission sense, in a bigger picture sense, if then the person somewhere says, oh, I want to share this with someone else, or they invite someone else into this, then we say that's like the icing on the cake. Then you really know, because no one in this case is really going to continue in that way if the Spirit of God's not working, right. if God's not revealing. And they may have already had a dream about Jesus. The man in white may have already come and revealed himself to them, but we don't know that. Right. We're slowly navigating the com conversation. But you're right. On the flip side, when there's opposition, when there's pushback, sometimes you know just not to, not to continue in that. But you planted a seed, and it may come back later. Or that person may meet yes. someone else and say, oh, that reminds me, this person told me this, yes. you know, type of thing. It's a they, journey. They might meet the man in white tonight That's in their exactly dream right. That's and exactly come back right. tomorrow and That's say, right. but then I'm thinking, you know, they say, well, hey, man, this is great. I want to have my brother come and have tea with us too. As the Christian, then you go through that whole security thing again. It's like, okay, now I got to watch the brother. Is, is he upset? Am I getting myself in trouble with him? It just seems like that would be such a minefield. But as you yes. say, it's not dependent on us. It's right. dependent on the Spirit. It's dependent on God guiding us. But I just think, I, I hope that helps people to pray yes. as they think about Afghan Christians that every single one of these conversations literally could cause them to be killed. Right. I mean, it's not, I'm not overstating that. Yes, that is right. the reality for them. Yes. And then you, you know, bring in another listener. Okay. Now we got to think through that again. Okay. Let's bring in another. Okay. Now we got to think through that again. It just, yes. it's hard to imagine thinking that way about every conversation. Like, yes. is this okay? Is this going to 
be the one. Mm -hmm. So I hope, like I say, I hope that equips people to pray. You mentioned technology. So I know that's happening. Seed planting is happening with our Afghan brothers and sisters in the country. Mm -hmm. It's also happening from outside the country. Talk a little bit about how that happens and how that's working. Well, thankfully, of the tens of thousands of Afghans that are scattered all over the planet, many of them, they're followers of Jesus. Either they knew Jesus before they left the country, before God sent them out, or they have found Jesus on the journey, you know what I'm saying, in, in a refugee camp. Or most of the time, Todd, the listeners probably would know this, and even Muslims have acknowledged this, that the majority of assistance that Afghans have received have been from the Christian community, whether that's in Europe or in Central Asia or in America or North, wh wherever it might yep. be. So, and they question that. And, why why well, aren't our Muslim brothers and sisters helping us, but these Christians who we're supposed to hate, that's right. they're helping us. That's right. There are Afghans, just Afghans. We're two North Americans, right? There are Afghans doing exactly what we are doing right now, either through their TikTok or through their WhatsApp or through their Instagram or even live radio, and even some of them do live TV. Now, it's not a television station necessary that you can watch on Channel 64 type of deal. It's a satellite type uh -huh. TV where you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on the other social media type of you know, websites that are available. And they're either sharing their testimony or they're interviewing someone who now is a follower of Jesus or they're talking about relevant issues for Afghans either in Afghanistan or wherever they may have scattered, like marriage, just family, you know, parenting, just mm -hmm. values of values of life that we would talk about. Then they have people that respond either live in the chat or send an email later, or they have a, a number that they provide and people can call back. And all of them, we're talking about dozens, I mean, around the world, dozens of ministries like that, all of them reporting openness, interest, surprising miracles, you know what I'm saying, and revelation of dreams and visions, people that really want to know the Lord and follow the Lord, even in some of the most dangerous places in Afghanistan, along with the opposition as well. Right. They'll, they'll, they'll get backlash as well. But that's so encouraging because we're talking about translation ministries. We're talking about just testimonial ministries, kind of like what we're doing right now. Some of it is more uh, visual, you know, Bible translation, but it would be an audio, you know, or a visual type of thing as opposed to print because there's so many people that can't, they can't read and they don't have access to it. And uh, I mean, I don't know if the listeners would know, you could go to the Version Bible app and it's over 2,000 languages. I know VOM, yep. we have resources as well where you can go to websites and yep. here you have thousands of resources that you can share in thousands of languages, you know. So, so, so the point is, because of the diaspora, that expression of seed sowing back into the country has almost exponentially multiplied because of now technology and the freedom to do so and Afghans that are hearts are also broken for God's light to shine in their country and they can't physically go back right now but they can reach back into their country via social media and all the ways all the appropriate technology and they do a similar thing as well as I mentioned earlier through their social media, they're contacting their family and friends and relatives and coworkers in a similar way. When they find some that want to ask questions and want to engage spiritually, they'll lead people to Christ in that particular way. Amen. And yeah, yeah. John Weaver has been giving us hopeful news about Afghanistan. I hope this week you'll be praying that Afghans will continue speaking to other Afghans about the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you missed any of this conversation, you can hear it again at our website, vomradio.net. You can also find the Voice of the Martyrs Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. And maybe you know someone else who would be encouraged to hear about the ways that God is speaking to people in Afghanistan. Share a link with them when you visit our website, again, vomradio.net. You can also find past episodes of Voice of the Martyrs Radio. We have had John Weaver here before. There's a great episode where he talks about his wedding in Afghanistan and how he and his wife used their wedding as a way of sharing the gospel there. There's other conversations with people working with Afghans, working to get the gospel into Afghanistan, as well as other hostile and restricted nations. Again, our website, vomradio.net, or find Voice of the Martyrs Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. Next week, John Weaver's going to be back, continuing to share how Afghan people 
are coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ and sharing that hope with others. I hope you'll be back for that conversation right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.